thanks for that introduction. Yeah, you, you've actually set me up uh, perfectly for, for the presentation. Um, but before I do that, uh, just on, on a personal level, I just want to echo the uh, statements by, by Chris and, and Alexander and Silvio, um, obviously regarding the current situation in Ukraine. Um, you know, we're, we're thinking about our colleagues there and, and obviously hoping for a, a swift, peaceful resolution uh, to the situation. Um, so let me jump into my presentation now. Um, all right. So uh, if everyone, please, please let me know if you can't see that. Um, but as Chris said, uh, I'm going to be talking a lot about critical infrastructure sectors, uh, sector C-certs. Um, but more than that, uh, what I really want to emphasize in, in my presentation here today um, is the idea of integrating your sector C-certs into the rest of your country's um, cybersecurity capabilities, um, which we call a, a national ecosystem. Um, so I'm going to talk uh, about a couple different things today um, here in the presentation, if I can get the slides to, to advance. There we are. <clears throat> so in order to get to that point where we're really understanding uh, not only how sector c search functions independently, um, but how sector c search can interact with one another uh, and with the rest of your uh, uh, national ecosystem, uh, including um, law enforcement, including national CSERT, uh, including private sector and, and all sorts of other entities. Um, we want to talk about first, what exactly a sector CSERT is, what our expert expectations are of an organization that we call a sector CSERT. Um, then we'll talk a little bit about this framework that, that, that the Software Engineering Institute has developed for building sector CSERTs. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about that national ecosystem, what exactly it is, uh, and how organizations can interact there. Um, I do have a, a short case study that I, I hope to get to um, if I have time, and we'll hopefully illustrate some of the things that, um, that I'll cover here in the rest of the presentation. So first of all, you know, I, I think sector CSERT is probably a term that a lot of us are familiar with. Um, maybe some of us aren't, aren't quite as familiar. Um, but coming up with a, a real solid unified definition of what a sector CSERT is, is kind of a challenge because this term means different things to different people, right? Um, how do you define what a sector is? Um, you know, are we talking about a, a sector of economy? Does it have to be critical infrastructure sector? There are a lot of different questions. Um, and, and then extending that from sector to sector CSERT, what exactly is a sector CSERT and, and what does it do? This is a definition that can vary from country to country. Um, and then we see additional terms. We see terms like uh, ISAC. Um, we see terms, now we're starting to see things like uh, sector SOCs and things like that, and different cybersecurity centers, partnerships, uh, public-private partnerships. So there's all these different terms and it can be a, a bit confusing to understand what exactly we're talking about. So for the purposes of this presentation and the purposes of the framework that I'm gonna talk about, um, we, call, we consider a sector CSERT um, any incident response capability that is responsible for a subset of a country or, or an economy. Now, this means that it includes a, a lot of different things. So our definition is pretty, pretty wide and pretty all encompassing. So we include things like ISACs uh, under this definition, even though you know, these are slightly different organizations with slightly different missions, when we're talking about it for the purposes of this framework and of this um, sort of discussion about national ecosystems, um, we think we can sort of categorize and group all these organizations together. Uh, so just keep that in mind throughout uh, as I go through the rest of the presentation. Of course, all, each organization is different, um, but for what we're talking about here, we can group them together. Um, there are a couple important things that we have to understand about sector CSERTs. Um, there are different tasks and different functions that a sector CSERT uh, can carry out. Uh, incident response, of course, is one of them. Uh, one of the more important tasks of a sector CSERT or any sector capability uh, is communication and coordination, uh, both among the members 
of that sector, um, but also with other sectors and the, the rest of that national ecosystem that, that I'll talk about. Um, hosting discussions, providing training, um, and building trust and confidentiality among members are, are all important things that a sector CSERT uh, or a sector capability can do. Again, not every sector CSERT is going to be doing all of these tasks. Um, some may, uh, but some may only perform a subset of these tasks. That's okay. That's still a sector CSERT. Um, but again, we have to keep in mind that each organization is different. And that might be true even within a country. You may have sector CSERTs within a country that are performing um, one set of services. And then for a different sector, there may be a CSERT that performs a different set of services. So the question and the challenge then becomes, how do we get these organizations to work together and to cooperate um, for the betterment of, of the whole? Um, <clears throat> one thing that I, I do wanna emphasize here is that sector CSERTs are unique organizations. Uh, they differ from national CSERTs or the PSERTs that Chris would have just talked about. Um, so th there are some things that we, we say a sector CSERT must do in order to be considered a sector CSERT. Uh, the most important thing is working to bridge the gap between public and private um, sector entities in a given country. So a, a financial sector CSERT, for example, may work to bridge the gap between a financial regulator and private sector banks. Um, that's a key function of a sector CSERT and, and perhaps one of the only things that we can really say that a sector CSERT has to be doing or we may not consider it a sector CSERT. Again, just something to keep in mind. Um, but when we have sector CSERTs, we can say that they provide certain advantages over these other organizations, uh, over um, national CSERTs or, or, or things like that. The two advantages that are most obvious and most important for sector CSERTs are scalability and expertise. The scalability is important to understand <clears throat> because having implementing a regime of sector CSERTs allows the rest of your organizations, the rest of your incident response organizations to sort of focus on different missions. So when we start to deploy sector CSERTs, now we see that the role of a national CSERT, for example, can be expanded and can focus on other things. Now, in terms of expertise, um, we see particularly in critical infrastructure or critical information infrastructure sectors um, that there is a lot of specialized knowledge and specialized skills necessary to respond to incidents in those um, sectors. So for example, the threats that are faced by a specific sector may be unique to that sector. Um, think of uh, power, um, critical infrastructure, um, financial sector, all of these different sectors will have specific threats that aren't seen in other sectors. So when you develop a sector CSERT, you're developing an organization or a body that can really focus on gaining expertise in those particular areas, uh, gaining expertise against particular types of attacks, gaining e expertise with particular software systems or hardware systems. Um, so the level of specialization that is enabled by a sector CSERT um, is one of the unique and, and critical roles that a sector CSERT will fill. So with an understanding of what a sector CSERT is and what we mean when we use that term, uh, the next term that we have to really define or describe is that national cybersecurity ecosystem. So for a little bit of background, um, what, when we were developing this sector CSERT framework that I'll, I'll talk about here in a little bit, um, we were thinking about a lot of, about the role of the, of the sector CSERT and how that sector CSERT interacts with the rest of the organizations in, in a particular country. And what we kind of realized was that there are a lot of different interactions between all of the different organizations that occur on a daily basis uh, or, or an annual basis. You have day-to-day -day communications, information sharing, uh, sharing of threat information, sharing of vulnerability information. Um, but then you also have less frequent interactions um, such as trainings uh, or awareness buildings 
or just cooperation. Um, and then you have ad hoc cooperation in the form of incident response uh, or something of that nature. So there are a lot of different ways that these organizations would interact or work together. Um, and, and we realized that we needed a, a term to describe all of those interactions between all of those different organizations. Again, those could include law enforcement, uh, national sea certs, private sector entities, uh, regulators. And in some cases, this could even in include transnational organizations um, such as FIRST um, or some of those sector sea certs that are international in, in nature, um, such as financial sector um, or transnational corporations. Um, so there are all these different stakeholders and all these different interactions. Um, so we thought that this was best described as a national cybersecurity ecosystem. Um, and that term describes both the organizations uh, and the interactions that occur on a daily basis and, and on a sort of more, more um, spread out, more like an annual basis. So there are a couple different important things to think about and to consider when we talk about that national cybersecurity ecosystem. Uh, one is the central role of a national CSERT in that national cybersecurity ecosystem. Uh, national CSERT tends to be at the center of it, and they tend to be the most common um, or most heavily relied upon uh, organization for coordinating and communicating across that ecosystem. Um, and then the second important factor is establishing trust. Within the national cybersecurity ecosystem, um, a lot of the interactions are based on a level of trust between the different organizations. Uh, without that trust, the types of helpful and necessary interactions and, and sharing of information starts to break down. So when we're thinking about sector C certs, we have to think about okay, how does my sector CSERT interact with the national ecosystem? Which means thinking about how will my national CSERT interact with the national CSERT? And how will my sector CSERT establish trust with all of the other stakeholders and all of the other players within this national ecosystem? So these are really important things to keep in mind and important considerations uh, when you're developing or implementing a sector CSERT. So in order to um, answer some of those questions, we started to go back um, when we were developing the sector CSERT framework and think about how do I develop these sector CSERTs or these sector-based capabilities? So we broke the process down into these six steps. And these six steps that we describe within the framework are designed to take you from a current state, which we call the as-is state, to a future state which we call the to be state. Now the as is state can be either nothing, it, it can be that we, we don't have a sector C cert, uh, or it can be that we have a sector C cert, but we wanna improve its function and further integrate it into that national cybersecurity ecosystem. So our to be state, we hope, is a functional capable sector C cert that is integrated with that national cybersecurity ecosystem um, and is capable of interacting with its peers uh, and sharing information and, and being successful and operating in that way. So to do that, we break the process in, into, again, these six steps. Um, first is considering prerequisites. Uh, these are things like understanding who's hosting your sector CSERT, um, who are the constituents, who are all the stakeholders. I'm thinking about how are you going to fund and staff and operate this sector CSERT. Um, step two is gathering information. This is going out and talking to all the stakeholders, understanding what their requirements are of the sector CSERT, um, what they hope the sector CSERT will be able to provide, and what they may be able to do to contribute to the functioning and the success of the, of the sector CSERT. Step three is to organize all of that information that has been discovered and evaluate the gaps. So the gaps will help you understand um, what is missing between your current as is state and your desired to be state. Once you've evaluated and understood those gaps, you can build a roadmap that will help you get from the as is to the to be. 
So for example, if you discover that you have a, a nascent um, undeveloped sector C cert, but you wanna have a fully integrated sector C cert, your roadmap may describe things like how do I establish protocols for communicating and sharing information with other sector C certs or with the national C cert? It may describe how I implement new incident response capabilities for this sector C cert. So the roadmap is really going to be a detailed document um, that describes not only what you want to achieve, um, but how you are going to achieve it. That lends into uh, step five which is to plan and implement the sector CSERT. Implementation is where we see, in our experience, a lot of sector CSERTs run into trouble, right? It's one thing to go and gather information and to say, okay, here are the challenge areas, here are the gaps. Okay, we're gonna to put together a document that says what we want to do to fill those gaps. But when it comes down to actually implementing that, um, this is where organizations run into challenges. So in the framework itself, um, which is published on the SEI's website, um, we have a lot of, of ideas and suggestions and plans for how to avoid those challenges. Uh, for example, um, securing stakeholder buy-in ahead of time, uh, building trust. I mentioned the importance of trust in that national cybersecurity ecosystem. Um, so things like that, understanding where you're gonna run into problems ahead of time will help you plan uh, to have a successful implementation. And then the last part of this process is to conduct post-implementation activities um, to understand where you've been successful and where you might need to do additional rounds of development in order to achieve your goal of really developing that sector CSERT and integrating it into that national ecosystem. As I mentioned the national ecosystem, I, I wanna emphasize that there are two points in this process, two steps, where we really see the importance of interacting with that national ecosystem, uh, understanding who all those stakeholders are um, and getting their buy-in and their, their participation for this process. Um, obviously at the beginning, when you're thinking about the prerequisites, you really need to consider, again, who are all the stakeholders in this process? Um, who are the organizations that my sector CSER will rely on for cooperation, for communication, for assistance, um, and then which organizations will be the constituency of this sector CSERT. Um, all of those things, again, are what will make up your national cybersecurity ecosystem uh, for a given country. So this is where you're really defining your national cybersecurity ecosystem. So you have to keep that in mind as you're doing that part of the process. Then again, in step five, as you start to implement, it's very important to keep in mind the national cybersecurity ecosystem because this is where um, we start to see actually the national cybersecurity system being affected by the presence of this, either this new organization, this new sector CSERT, or by the sector CSERT that now has an expanded role um, or a more in-depth or more detailed mission. So a lot of times the challenges here are that new roles or responsibilities are being allocated to a sector CSERT. And this is a change from what was happening previously. So maybe previously a national, national CSERT was handling certain tasks or certain roles that are now gonna be done by a sector CSERT. So we have to understand how this affects the operation of the national CSERT and also how it affects the constituency that previously worked with the national CSERT and now will be working with the sector CSERT. Um, so again, thinking about all the stakeholders and how they're being affected um, at different parts of this process is, is really important. Um, I'm gonna skip that. Um, <clears throat> a couple important things that we wanna keep thinking about as we talk about, um, especially integrating that, that um, sector CSERT with the national cybersecurity ecosystem um, is services, services that the sector CSERT will offer um, and services that the sector CSERT may not offer. Um, so again, a lot of you are probably familiar with the first CSERT services framework. Um, this breaks the function of, of a CSERT into several service areas and then sub areas or sub services, of course. Um, 
And what I just want to emphasize here is that um, when you're thinking about the functions of the sector CSERT and the rest of the national cybersecurity ecosystem, you have to consider uh, which services will be offered by which organization essentially. So in the framework, uh, the sector CSERT framework, um, we have in, in an appendix um, that describes different service areas um, and considerations for which may be appropriate for a sector CSERT um, and which may be best left to other organizations like national CSERT or private sector uh, or, or things like that. Um, but as you're establishing your sector CSERT or thinking about developing a sector CSERT, um, what you wanna do is understand what is needed for that organization to provide those services. Uh, what sorts of knowledge, skills, and ability your sector CSERT will need if they wanna offer different services. Uh, so we cover all that uh, in the framework there. All right, I already talked a, a lot about integrating with the national cybersecurity ecosystem, um, but I, I think it, it bears repeating some of the specific considerations. Um, it, again, if you're operating, creating, uh, or, or improving a sector CSERT, um, we wanna ask some of these key questions as we, we go through the process. Um, I mentioned the relationship between the sector CSERT and the national CSERT, um, that is critically important of course, sometimes we see it's the case, uh, particularly in, in developing countries, um, sometimes there is no national CSERT, um, but sectors may be ahead of the national um, government in implementing uh, CSERT capabilities. Uh, so we see in particular frequently the national, or I'm sorry, frequently the financial sector um, can sometimes be ahead of uh, the national government in implementing uh, a sector-based capability, um, but you have to understand even then um, what may be the future state uh, in terms of if a national CSERT is created later on, how will my sector CSERT interact with that? Um, and even if there's no national CSERT, um, what are government requirements um, for incident response or for cybersecurity? Um, is there law enforcement? Uh, are there national security considerations? Are there legal requirements? And so these are all important considerations. Um, and then finally, um, how will the sector CSERT address issues of bridging the gap between the public sector and the private sector? Again, this is a critically important part of, of understanding that national cybersecurity ecosystem uh, and, and understanding how uh, or what role the, cyber, the national or the sector CSERT uh, will play. Um, so I just wanted to go through a quick case study that I, I think illustrates some of um, some of the challenges that that you can see in this process of developing a sector CSERT. So I'm not going to name the country that we partnered with, um, but this case study is based on an actual uh, partner that that the SEI uh, worked with to develop sector-based capabilities. Um, so just by background. Uh, in this country, prior to our engagement with them, um, this country had implemented uh, a bunch of cybersecurity and incident response measures um, in their sectors. Um, there had been government directives, um, not, not legal legislation, um, but sort of executive actions that had required these sectors to create new cybersecurity capabilities for the purpose of, of securing that country's critical infrastructure. However, um, what had happened in this country is that there was no strategy. Um, there was no um, effort put into developing any strategy or understanding how all of these organizations would interact, not only with each other, um, but with, it, with the national government and with law enforcement and, and other organizations. As a result, um, essentially there was a lot of wasted time and, and effort um, as these sectors went through the process of trying to establish the capability, um, but without any guidance or without any understanding of what the other sectors were doing. Um, so we started our collaboration um, with this country and our engagement there in, in 2016. Um, and we started by doing um, basically a review of the current state um, and helping them to develop a, a, 
a vision to move forward in sort of an organized um, collaborative fashion across sectors. So we developed an action plan, which would be equivalent to that roadmap that I would have described or that we describe in the, um, in the framework. And we've revalidated that uh, work plan or that action plan um, by discussing it with all the stakeholders in February of 2017. To implement this, again, implementation is the stage where a lot of challenges can occur. Um, we did a couple of things. We did some workshops and some training, um, but what we did is we brought the national CSERT and the sector CSERT partners together and had them go through these workshops and these trainings together so they all understood um, things like roles and responsibilities uh, and had an opportunity to meet each other in person and interact with each other and to establish some of those relationships that are critical to the success of that national cybersecurity ecosystem. Uh, so you can see here just a, a list of trainings and topics that we um, that we did with these organizations. Um, and then at the end, we made a few recommendations. Uh, we recommended that the, the government um, and the stakeholders in this country um, put together a, a series of documents um, and, and a series of artifacts that would help guide them to implementing their sector CSERTs and integrating those sector CSERTs with the rest of, of the ecosystem that they had in existence in this country. Um, so um, we recommended that they put together a, a charter for each of their organizations, um, concepts of operations, um, staffing guidelines, training guidelines. Um, and then we put together a list of sort of work that, they, that these organizations could be doing and could be cooperating on. Um, and we had them define these in policy and in documentation um, so that everyone knew with what each organization would be doing and understood how they would interact with each other. Um, so that said, um, with that example, um, I just wanted to sort of bring it back to um, the, the Sector CSER framework um, and talk about that really just a little bit. Um, again, the purpose of the document is to establish, you know, what a sector CSERT is and, and how we develop one. Um, so we understand when we're developing a sector CSERT um, that there are, are different procedures and different policies that are applicable based on um, what the sector needs, um, what technology it's using, what the sensitivity of that sector is, um, and, and what critical infrastructure or non-critical infrastructure is being protected. Um, so again, that document is published on the SEI website. Uh, we encourage you to, to go check that out um, and learn a little bit more about the process um, and, and a little bit more about implementing sector CSERTs and integrating them into the national uh, ecosystem. Um, so that is it. That's my presentation. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions uh, at this point. I saw there were some, there have been a couple of comments on the chat channel. Uh, I think Andrew Cormack's talked about going open mic if he wants. Does, does anyone want to raise a hand or put something in the chat? Okay, I guess we'll leave it there. There are comments. I, I don't know if you want to address those in the chat. Uh, yeah, I see, I see a couple of comments. Um, uh, thank you, Mark, for sharing the link uh, to our sector CSERT framework. Um, and I see uh, Otmar has also shared uh, just a, a resource there. Um, yeah, and, and to Andrew Cormick, uh, to, to your comment, I, I absolutely agree. Uh, with the, the distinction that you've made between uh, CSERT and some, something like, a, I guess, like, a, like an ISAC or a different organization. Um, I, I think, it, it, just to go back to you know, where I started, uh, for the purposes of, of this process that I'm talking about, um, we, we actually, in, in the framework, 
we use the term sector-based capability as sort of a, a more broad, all-encompassing term, just to talk about the process of developing a capability um, that will be part of your national cybersecurity ecosystem. Um, I, I kind of slipped into just using the, the term sector CSERT, um, which is, is one type of sector-based capability. Uh, an ISAC is a different type of, of sector-based capability. Um, but when we talk about the process of developing these capabilities, integrating them with the national ecosystem, uh, we think that the same process is applicable regardless of if you're doing a CSERT or an ISAC or something else. Um, but obviously you have to understand that the actual function of the team, the functioning of that capability will differ depending on its mission and what type of team it actually is, whether it's a CSERT or, or an ISAC. So yeah, I completely agree with, uh, with your observation. Yes, it's, 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 it's easy to, to confuse the terms and, and I, I apologize, I was not using sector-based capability. Um, yeah. I think you're absolutely right. I, I, I've seen this as well that, you know, people, banks talk to banks because they understand each other. They can have a common taxonomy. They've got the same problems and making sure that that doesn't stay purely in the banking sector and reaches that national cert. So you can then look for patterns across multiple sectors is really, really important. So. That was very interesting. Thank you, Justin. I appreciate, appreciate you taking the time to spend with us for that. That's great. Uh, one, more, one more raised hand. Otmar. Yes, so does this work actually? Yes, looks good. Uh, some comments from my side because we actually have done this. So then also there is the Austrian energy sector, as you said, and some points from our experience. Um, it's not easy to get the whole sector to come together and, and reach a common goal. And not easy at all. Uh, for some it's easier, for some others it's quite impossible. Uh, but when, once you get this, it it's really helps. Second point is funding. Uh, in our case, uh, the sectoral CSERT is actually funded by the sector itself. That um, has some positive effects because uh, that way it's clear that the sector CSERT is theirs. It's their, um, they're the team that they are buying services from. It's not the government uh, forcing them to interact with them. It's a supplier for the, for, the, for the sector. And that makes for a very different type of relation than, than between the private sector and the, and the government entity. Um, this really helps in some way because uh, very depending on, on your country, but uh, in some places, it's not easy to tell uh, an employee talk to, to this government, government agency versus talk to this, our self-selected uh, supplier of, of services. This is a very different way of interaction and it really helps. So, so if you have any other questions regarding our experience, uh, just um, ask me in the chat or whatever. Uh, we're happy to share our experience. Thank you. Thank you for that. Those are really, really important comments. Um, and I think they emphasize the fact that, and again, we talk about this a bit in the framework, um, that every deployment of one of these capabilities is unique and different and needs to meet the specific requirements of, of the country or the sector um, at, the, at the time. Um, you know, the idea of, of who should host this and who should fund it is, is really important. Uh, for example, we see in, in some countries um, the regulatory body for a particular sector may also host the sector CSERT, um, and there are advantages to that model, but there are disadvantages as well, right? Um, so if, if your financial regulator is also the government organization that hosts a financial sector CSERT uh, or, or a, se a sector capability, um, you know, you could have some some hesitancy over reporting of incidents or, or things like that, because the people who are supposed to be sharing the information are also your regulator. Um, there's, of course, advantages to, to that model, um, but I, I think to, to your point there, um, you have to carefully consider the advantages and disadvantages and, and do whatever is gonna be um, most, most advantageous for your specific case. Uh, very much agree with that. I think we had similar things in the UK with the Bank of England who wanted to join to learn how people to defend themselves, but also were the regulators. So, yeah, that's a very important point. 
Excellent. I think that's it. Justin, thank you very much for your